It's the 9th of December, 2022. This is the Room Now Podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, Executive Editor of RoomNow.com. This week, a lot of things to cover, but... You know, first I have to apologize for my accent. I just got back from New York. How you doing? I might be talking a little funny. I'm there for a week and, you know, I sort of like an accent refresher course. I'll say things like coffee and dog and water and you'll know where I've been. So, or I could have said, hey, good day, mate. I just got back from Brooklyn and confused all of you. So let's talk about catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. This is kind of tough stuff, isn't it? Well, a bit of a clinical aid comes to us in the form of a review of 120 patients with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And surprisingly, um, half of them had evidence of skin manifestations that sort of supported the diagnosis. You know, a lot of things could happen and, and a lot of bad things can happen in catastrophic antiphospholipid, but uh, 54% had skin involvement and it, in many of them, I think it was uh, um, 35% of the patients had the, uh, the skin manifestation as their first hint of having first antiphospholipid syndrome that spun out of control into CAS. This included finding, findings of livido uh, racemosa in 45%, either skin necrosis or uh, ulcerative lesions in 42%, splinter hemorrhages, distal edema in 23%. Uh, not something I would have expected, um, but it was found enough that they felt it was part of the syndrome. Not surprisingly, purple in 14%. So the point being that these findings could be uh, harbingers of worse APS yet to come and something worth considering. Uh, a big review in JAMA ne Network Open, that's sort of like the lesser version of JAMA maybe, not sure, um, looked at cardiovascular complications associated with lupus patients who deliver, who have their deliveries in the hospital. Most people have their deliveries in the hospital, but um, Using the national inpatient sample, like a bazillion patients, they had 77,000 lupus uh, hospitalizations where there was a del uh, delivery related to the pregnancy. Um, and they looked for um, uh, cardiovascular complications and cardiac associations. Um, and they have a list uh, of them here that, um, not surprising, but um, preeclampsia, peri peripartum cardiomyopathy, heart failure, arrhythmias, acute kidney injury, stroke, VTEs, all these being present um, complicated the pregnancy, increased the cost of hospitalization. Um, bad things can happen uh, at the time of delivery in lupus and vigilance on your part in taking care of such patients. Uh, a longitudinal study of over I think it was 10,000 parents and their children actually looked at a lot of different clinical things. And in the 6,100 patients that were followed and assessed at age 14, they looked at the association of uh, joint hypermobility with subsequent manifestations and what happened to these uh, kids. And what they found was that um, overall generalized hypermobility, now they didn't meet um, the usual criteria for hypermobility. They didn't really go into that. They said that 19%, uh, almost 20% had generalized joint hypermobility, more so in um, the girls than boys. Um, but when they reassessed those patients some four years later, age 18, um, depression was more common, three and a half fold more common, and anxiety was significantly more common at age 18. The point being that hi joint hypermobility may be the prelude or may have associations to anxiety and depression in uh, kids. Now, I've seen a lot of kids with fibromyalgia, and if I see a kid with fibromyalgia, the first thing I'm checking for is joint hypermobility. They, they kind of go hand in hand, and most of the hypermobilities present with fibromyalgia-like manifestations. Why does a child of, you know, six or 16 have fibromyalgia? And I, you know, I'm looking for causes. Hypermobility could be one of them. But, you know, depression, anxiety, um, stress within the household, 
different forms of abuse. You know, these are all things that you should be looking for in kids who have fibromyalgia, and in this case, maybe hypermobility. Uh, an assessment of over a thousand patients who presented with polyarthralgias. Um, this is a population-based study. Uh, there was a thousand fifty-five consecutive patients seen, um, and eight percent of them were diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. The diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis was more common in the face of a positive family history of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis that increased the odds fourfold. Um, in the presence of the patient having psoriasis, that increased the odds 79-fold. Uh, radiographic erosions, a five-fold increase, and an ultrasound power Doppler signal increased the odds of PSA sevenfold. Not surprisingly, the presence of rheumatoid factor and or CCP was a negative association with a subsequent diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Another study looked at methotrexate tolerability and compared psoriatic arthritis patients to RA patients. So this was a cohort of like 240 PSA patients and like a bazillion, it says here 86,000 RA patients who were either starting methotrexate or TNF and they looked at um, adverse uh, effects that were seen with both drugs. Turns out the adverse effect profile was similar between um, the PSA and RA populations when they were starting TNF inhibitors. Not, not dissimilar. So you, what you get with TNF, you get with TNF regardless of the indication you're treating. However, if you were treated with methotrexate, it was different. They showed that uh, methotrexate toxicity was greater in PSA patients than RA to the tune of 45% versus 29%. More so having uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, depression, tinnitus. I didn't think tinnitus was a side effect of methotrexate, but these author authors seem to think it might be. I found it interesting. Of course, we worry more about methotrexate use in the psoriasis population because of the greater risk of, of cirrhosis and liver disease and you know, for many years, I believed it didn't even work. It wasn't even indicated, but that's been, that was sort of um, um, struck down by, I think, by the PSA seam study that Jeff Curtis presented some some years back. Actually, it was Phil Meese who presented that. Jeff Curtis did the RA study uh, from seam. Uh, a large study coming out of the Johns Hopkins scleroderma cohort, where they have over um, 30, almost 3,400 patients, found that 29% had calcinosis. Of that 29%, 13.5% were said to have a heavy burden of calcinosis. Not sure how they quantified a heavy burden of calcinosis, but, you know, it's the Johns Hopkins scleroderma study, you know, um, I kind of <laughs> will go with what they say. They're, they're the experts, and they do truly some fabulous work. The interesting thing was that they showed that the finding of calcinosis was associated with um, diffuse disease as opposed to limited disease. More severe disease, as measured by the presence of pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease, cardiac manifestations, uh, mitral regurg, I think was one of them, um, GI involvement, renal crisis, myopathy, and bad rainouts. And in for each of those, um, there was a three to almost seven-fold increased risk. The other thing was that they found the significant association between the PMSCL antibody and the findings of calcinosis. So that if you had the PMSCL antibody, you had a 17-fold higher risk of having calcinosis. Um, I don't usually test for PMSCL. Um, we've talked about a lot in the last few years about NXP2, the new, newer myositis-associated antibody being associated with a significant risk of calcinosis, but that would be in myositis patients. I doubt that they have NXP2 uh, antibodies in this large scleroderma cohort, but really useful, clinically useful um, profiling from the Hopkins group. Another interesting study looked at um, 227 patients uh, who had systemic sclerosis and compared those who had ILD or did not have ILD. And the ones who had systemic sclerosis, ILD associated disease, were more likely to have muscle disease, myopathy, two and a half fold increased risk, um, evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, uh, pro uh, pulmonary hypertension, diffuse skin disease, um, 
uh, anti-SCL70 antibodies and a few other features. So again, that's not surprising. The presence of ILD portends a poor outcome, more aggressive disease, probably more manifestations that would lead to poorer, outco- poorer outcomes. In the Netherlands, they did a recent study that had to do with um, electronic health monitoring via in telehealth. So they looked at 220 patients that were consecutively seen with inflammatory arthritis like RA, PSA, AS, et cetera, and they enrolled them in a electronic remote health monitoring study that basically showed um, patients don't stick to it. The idea was that patients were contacted to engage with this e-health assessment that would be on their phone um, they gave, were given warnings, they were given reminders, they were given prompts, and patients were supposed to do electronic self-assessment via the app. And you know what? A shocking number of them dropped out. Um, 64%, two-thirds dropped out. This is one of the things that undermines electronic uh, remote monitoring. So even when there's a reminder there, and this is this, uh, you know, maybe one of the reasons why telehealth may not succeed as much as we'd like to. We have a number of other things about telehealth that we put up this week if you're interested. Um, a systematic review uh, looked at uh, the comparison of the uh, Kawasaki's disease and the COVID-related MISC disease. Um, there's a review of the literature, 14 studies, almost 3,000 patients. Um, interestingly, they did not point out what I think is the major difference, and that is age. Um, Kawasaki's disease patients tend to be younger, um, whereas the MISC patients tend to be more like teenagers. But they did show that um, MISC patients had more pulmonary and GI disease and shock and more cardiac manifestations, including um, LV disease, valvular uh, uh, disease, pericarditis, myocarditis. But Compared to the Kawasaki's patients, MISC had less coronary lesions and less conjunctivitis. So if that's a help in those of you who take care of such kids, um, uh, thankfully with the downside of COVID, hopefully we'll see less and less of the MISC uh, complication. Uh, a retrix, another study from the National Inpatient um, Sample Data acquired over a four-year period looked at 60,000 gout admissions. And how many do you think had evidence of a cardiac arrhythmia. You know, a lot of comorbidity and gout. They have, you know, a, I wouldn't know the number. I didn't. I wouldn't think it would be high, but in, the, in this study, 25% had evidence of arrhythmias. They tend to be older gout patients. Um, AFib was the most common at 88% of cases. Um, less, Much less common, flutter at 6%, VTAC at 3%. Uh, patients with gout and arrhythmias had a significantly, a twofold higher risk of um, mortality um, and compared to those who didn't have arrhythmias. So again, it speaks to the fact that gout patients are, are complicated. They're, um, especially the ones who have severe disease and those are, that, are, that are poorly treated, the outcomes are not good. Um, a recent article looking at um, lung disease and whatnot brought, uh, prompted a, an editorial that Jeff Sparks and colleagues wrote talking about, I thought, I thought it was a nice read. It was a good review of, of the links between the pathogenesis of RA and lung disease that's sort of uh, promoted by um, pollution, smoking, silica dust, asbestos, textile dust, brick or concrete laying, pesticides, military burn pits, all of those being associated with an increased risk of RA. This goes to the mucosal etiology theory of RA and, um, and patients who are CCP positive are, are, are higher risk, I think, when and maybe they become CCP positive because of these exposures. But if there was ever a reason for rheumatologists to get excited about and battle against global warming, um, it would be this data, which really has become sort of overwhelming in the last 10 years, the contribution of pollution and inhaled pollutants on the risk of RA. More interesting, of course, is that when that occurs in certain populations, those who have the shared epitope, uh, and then also um, um, anti-CCP antibodies, you know, it it ups the risk of RA. Interestingly, these um, 
are, are not associated associations with uh, ACPA negative patients. So it's a nice story about the pathogenesis of RA that we should put into action as far as prevention. Uh, I found a nice article on acute lymphoblastic leukemia, not something we see a lot of, but I've seen a few patients in my career that had um, ALL and had musculoskeletal manifestations. This literature review talked about 29 patients um, with um, seven of them having peripheral arthritis, seven ha 17 having axial disease, 21 with osteolytic lesions, probable source of most of their pain, um, four having vertebral fractures and hypercalcemia in nine cases. Point being, it can happen, folks. The arthritis that does occur in the periphery looks more degenerative, and, and I get a, it, it probably should prompt a search for um, an osteolytic lesion that could be the underlying um, association. Um, we had a, two articles and a few tweets this week about the introduction of biosimilars into the marketplace starting in 2023. Humira has been around since 2012. Uh, Humira or Adalimumab biosimilars um, since 2018. They have been actively uh, prescribed in other parts of the world since 2018, but because of patent protections, um, they were not going to see uh, Adalimumab biosimilars until 2023. And that's going to begin in January of 2023 with Amgen's biosimilar called Amgevita. And then in July, there's, I think, five more from Pfizer, um, Behringer, Samsung Bio, Epis, Coherus, Sandoz, uh, and Biocon, I think, happens in September of 2023. There's going to be a lot of adalimumab biosimilars. It's going to flood the market. You already have three in the United States biosimilars, four in um, What about all these adalimumab? How's that gonna change practice? How's that gonna change the cost? Will the lower costs equate to more patients getting on more aggressive therapies? These questions and more, tune in in 2023. Two more reports, um, I thought important studies that appeared in the journals. The target trial from uh, John Giles and Dan Solomon, uh, Joan Bathon and a, a host of co-investigators from around the country, a very hard study that they recruited for. Um, RA patients who are active disease despite receiving methotrexate. Um, and then they are, so what they tend to do is they randomize them to either receive a TNF inhibitor or triple DMARD therapy, right? So they follow them for 24 weeks. They do pre-intervention, post-intervention, FDG, FDG PET CTs looking at vascular information of the carotid arteries and corona uh, and, and aorta as sort of a surrogate to what's happening uh, at the heart, which of these therapies gives is more cardioprotective. At the end of 24 weeks, so 159 were randomized, 138 completed. At the end of 24 weeks, the, um, they had uh, their DAS scores, which were equal at the front end, all dropped on both treatment groups. No significant difference there. But the, the reductions in um, vascular inflammation um, uh, were the same between groups and that there was no association between um, vascular inflammation scores and clinical outcomes. So this was largely done to see if there was superiority. And so this is yet another study that sort of backs the Jim Modell triple DMART thinking that being aggressive, even with cheap medicines, has significant clinical benefits down, downstream, in this case, cardiovascular. Um, the Be Complete study was published this week. Um, that's uh, a study using um, bimikizumab, the dual IL-17A and F inhibitor, um, when the drug was being given, was given to 400 patients who were refractory to TNF inhibitors um, or failed a TNF inhibitor. They either gave them bimikizumab, 160 milligrams every four weeks, or placebo. You'd expect 
an IL-17 inhibitor to win here, and it did big. Primary endpoint was ACR50. It was 43% with the bimikizumab and only 7% with placebo. Uh, and then similarly, skin scores uh, strongly favored the bimikizumab over placebo, 69% versus 7%, 7% that being very significant. Uh, this is going to be one of the important registration trials for this next IL-17 inhibitor that hits the market. Is it going to be different than ones you already have? Um, there's a host of studies that you're going to have to look at as this gets rolled out. Um, it's probably going to be approved in psoriasis first, and then down the line, we'll hopefully get approved in psoriatic arthritis. That's it for this week on the podcast. Hope you enjoyed this and um, all the new podcasts that we're looking forward to in 2023. Um, uh, you can now register for Room Now Live. It's the next generation meeting. It's a hybrid meeting, both on site and virtual. It's going to be in Dallas, Texas on March 19th and 18th and 19th, a day and a half meeting, about 13 hours of CME. It's fabulous. Um, you can go to roomnow.live to register. Think about it. We want to see you there. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.